Good morning, everyone. Today is April 15th, 2020, tax day. Remember when that was a big deal? <laughs> now everybody is more worried about other things and about taxes, especially since uh, the day you have to send it in has been delayed by the IRS. A um, couple of things about how I've been doing. You'll notice that I'm not in my office slash bedroom this morning. Um, my wife has taken the opportunity um, with this uh, stay at home order to do a lot of painting in the house. So she's actually painting our bedroom. So I'm in my son's bedroom and it appeared to him that we need to have some watchers for my vlog. So I have some watchers over my left shoulder here. So be good everyone because they're going to watch me and watch you uh, as we do this vlog. Um, it is, it's good to talk to you again. Um, as I've noted on my other vlogs, I miss seeing people. Um, I'm very thankful to be at home and to spend a lot of time with my family. That's been very good. I hope your experience is the same. Uh, but it's also, I think everybody's thinking about when is this going to be over so we can get back to normal, whatever normal is going to be. So I'd like to pray with you <clears throat> and then talk a little bit about something that I was remembering about Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. And then for the kids, of course, I will do a little Herman at the end. You know, usually when I would start these videos, I would say, hello, Redeemer. And I don't think I said that this morning. And the reason I didn't is I've noticed on my Facebook page, there are a lot of people who are not Redeemerites who've been watching these. So that's okay. That's good. Um, I think it's gone all the way from Florida to uh, Alberta, Canada. So that's great. Uh, it's good to see you all as well. Uh, even though I wouldn't see you in person, even if we were not required to be at home. I do miss you, and uh, it's good to make those kind of informal contacts. So I'd like to pray with you and then talk a little bit about systematic theology, and then we'll get to a Herman story. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, the Word of God says that you are present with us by your Spirit. In fact, one of Jesus' great promises before he ascended to heaven was that he would be with his disciples always. He told his disciples about that earlier in John, that when he left, he would not leave them as orphans, but he would remain with them by his Spirit. And we are thankful that the Spirit of Christ came on Pentecost and he has filled us with the power and the ability and the self-control to follow after Christ. That might mean different things for different people, especially during this time of stay-at-home orders. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be at work in us, even if we can't understand what's going on around us. We pray that you would drive us deep into your word, that this would be a time when many of us can return to an appreciation of just sitting down and reading your word and meditating on it and spending time in prayer. Lord, our, our lives are ordinarily so busy and we crowd out some of the basic things because of that busyness. And it's a gift from you that our lives have slowed down. And we pray that we would not waste that time by just spending um, time looking at the internet or by watching movies or whatever we might do to pass the time. Instead, this will be a time of great growth for your people. I pray for those who are suffering. I pray for those who have lost their jobs and are wondering about financial security, for those who are lonely, um, either because they're widowed or perhaps they're single or whatever the situation might be. I even pray for the people who are lonely, even though they have family around them and their family conflicts. I pray for those for whom this is a real struggle because they um, wrestle with a particular sin. This uh, time is a time in which that, that uh, temptation to sin is really strong. Lord, you will have the ability to be with us all, and we pray that your power and your glory would be seen in the lives of your people. I also pray with um, your people this morning that you would also withdraw the virus, both from our nation and from the world. Lord, you have the power to do that. You created this world. There's nothing that you do not know and you do not control and we pray that you would uh, withdraw this, that we would that we would learn what you are teaching us, and that you would withdraw it as well to spare the suffering that is happening. Father, we are thankful that through Jesus Christ we call you our Father, and that you are good always. And we pray that we would turn to you in faith and in confidence, knowing that you will continue to take care of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I wanted to talk this morning with you about something... Um, that I didn't read this past week, but I remember from a few weeks ago, um, Wayne Grudem in his introduction to systematic theology um, essentially says that everyone should be a systematic theologian. Now, 
That may seem very strange to you. In fact, you might think, I've not been to seminary. I've never read a systematic theology. How in the world can I be a systematic theologian? Well, his basic definition of systematic theology is systematic theology provides us answers to the questions that we're asking about the scriptures. And because it's a very basic definition, um, the way to do systematic theology is also quite basic. And I want to kind of pull back the curtain on the way systematic theologians do their work and then tell you that it's also something you can do. In fact, there is no substitute for actually reading and studying the Bible for yourself. So reading a systematic theology as I've been doing is really good. But if that's where you hope to get your um, spiritual nourishment from, it's a little bit like eating regurgitated food. It's not that appealing as a substitute for the real thing. It can be okay but it's not really as good as actually eating it for yourself. And that would be like studying the word of God uh, for yourself. Um, and he encourages people to do that studying of the scripture for itself. And if you're wondering, how, what does that process look like? Uh, I want to note that for you. Um, this is from his introduction to systematic theology. Um, if you've got the same edition I do, if you've bothered to order a copy, this is on page 35. He says, we should study systematic theology by collecting and understanding all the relevant passages of scripture on any topic. Now, how do you do that? Many people will think that studying the chapters in this book and reading the Bible verses noted in the chapters is enough. But some people will, 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 uh, will want to do even further study of scripture on a particular topic or study some new topic not covered here. How could a student go about using the Bible to research its teaching on some new subject, perhaps not one discussed explicitly in any of his or her systematic theology textbooks. And then he said the process would look like this. First, find all the relevant scripture verses. And he says the best help in this step is a good concordance, which enables one to look up key words and find the verses in which those subjects are being treated. For example, in studying what it means that man is created in the image and likeness of God, one needs to find all the verses in which image or likeness or create occur. So then you put those verses into sort of a list. It's even easier than what he, he talks about here in terms of use of a concordance. There is a lot of Bible software that's available now, much of it free, that you can use to do this work, and you don't have to page through a book. So if you're looking for a topic, that's a place to start. So what does the Bible say about this topic or that topic? Go through a concordance or do a study. Um, on words in the scriptures and use those studies, then uh, use those uh, uh, word studies not just to look at those particular verses, but look at cross -ref references so that you're looking at various verses and look at those verses within context. The second step, he says, is to read, make notes on, and try to summarize the points made in the relevant verses. Sometimes the themes will be easy to understand, sometimes difficult, but make notes on them. Don't just record these are the verses, but make notes on those verses and try to understand what those verses are saying. And then finally, he says, the teachings of the various verses should be summarized into one or more points that the Bible affirms about that subject. So you see, it's the process of finding the information, trying to understand that information, and then synthesize that information into what you think the Bible teaches about that particular thing. The summary does not have to take the exact form of anyone else's conclusions on that subject because we may see things differently in scriptures that others have missed, or we may organize the subject differently or emphasize different things. At this point, he says, it's also helpful when you've done your own study to compare what you've learned with what others have said. And that's when reading a systematic theology like Wayne Grudem's uh, systematic theology is really helpful because you might have missed some things or maybe you're jumping to conclusions that aren't warranted. So that's when having conversation partners can be really helpful. So if you're interested in doing your own systematic theology work, that's all it is. Looking for Bible verses, reading them within context, making a list of those verses, and trying to synthesize what those verses say. Now, that may sound rather simple, but I tell you that a lot of the study that even pastors are trained to do is not that basic. And so in seminary, I was taught to read systematic theology, not necessarily to do systematic theology, um, I'm sure I was encouraged to do that. This is no affront to my seminary professors. I love you all. But it's simply to say that this is work that each one of us can do. And it's work that is important and good and is really nourishing to our souls. So if you've got some time, pick a subject, whatever the subject is, and follow that pattern and see if you can discover what the Bible says. It's not just work for pastors, although I love doing that work, so I'm not complaining. 
it's, it's work for the people of God, no matter who you are and whatever God has called you to do for your life's work ordinarily. So let's become a, a group of people who are serious in the study of God's word and um, have some encouragement in how to do that. So that's reflections on Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. And now for a Herman story. <clears throat> now last week I gave you a throwback Herman story um, that came from my mom. Uh, as I pointed out last week, she also sent in a picture of what she thought Herman the Worm's grandmother looked like. Uh, other people have sent in other pictures, and I realize I didn't run any of those off, so I'll show you a few of those next week. Uh, thank you for those of you who have done that. I probably have, I don't know, 10 or so. Um, if you'd like to do that, you still can. Just draw a picture or color a picture of what Herman looks like and send it in. But now I want to go back to where we left Herman a number of weeks ago. Do you remember? Um, I was working in my garden, and Herman ended up in a shovel full of dirt and then was placed in the garden that I was working on. So that's where Herman is now, and we'll pick up the story there. So Herman rooting around in my garden. This morning, when Herman woke up, his mom said to, me, uh, said to him, Herman, have you looked outside? So Herman built up, 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 until his little head stuck above the dirt, and he looked around, and what did he see? Oh, big surprise. Even though it's April 15th, do you know what he saw? It was not nice, cozy black dirt. He saw something very different. It was white, and it was kind of wet, and it was very, very cold. So he went back down into his home, and he said to his mother, Mother, what is that outside today? His mother said, Well, Herman, you live in Michigan. and Michigan, we have snow even in April, didn't you know that? Herman said, No, I didn't. I thought it was springtime. In springtime, there isn't snow. There's sunshine, and there's glass, and there's nice, warm, black dirt. But that's not what it is today. Well, his mother said, as a worm, you cannot go in the snow. The snow is not good for worms. You have to stay inside today. But Herman thought that was okay, and he played with his brother and his sister. And it was okay for a while, but after a while, Herman had that problem that many of us have. He was bored. Very, very bored. So what did Herman do? Herman thought, maybe I'll go play in the snow. But you know that Herman and Herman and other ones like Herman, they don't want to have gloves. They don't have boots. They don't have feet to put boots on. They don't have a coat. They don't have a cap. And so when Herman crawled out of this hole and started playing in the snow, he started to get very, very, very cold. But he thought, it's okay. It won't bother me. So he crawled further and further from its hole. And the further he went, the more cold he got. Until finally, Herman got so cold that he froze stiff. Do you know what a worm looks like when it is frozen stiff? It kind of looks like a stick. And so today, I'm going to go out in my garden and see if I can see Herman out there. I have to look for Herman sort of like I'm looking for a stick. And maybe Herman's like that where you live, too. too. So if your mom or your dad would let you, and you get on your coat and your shoe, or your boots and your and your stocking cap and maybe some gloves, maybe you can go outside and try to find Herman as well. Just remember, you're looking for a worm that's going to be frozen stiff like a stick. Well, hopefully pretty soon the sun's going to come out and the warm rays of the sun will warm up Herman and warm up us too and melt the snow and then Herman can get back to making my garden a good place for plants. Well, hopefully next week, I'll be talking to you when there's sunshine outside. Until then, it's been good to talk about Herman and about systematic theology. I miss you all, and we'll see you next week. Bye.